Welcome everybody to today's webinar and town hall meeting. As I speak, there are more joining us and we are very excited about this transatlantic link, which is a partnership event, as you can see from our screen, with Berlin-based transatlantic institutions and political foundations joining us to co-host this event, as there are the American Academy, the Atlantic Brücke Berlin, the German Atlantic Association, the Heinrich Böll Foundation, the American Chamber of Commerce, the Friedrich Ebert Foundation, the Friedrich Naumann Foundation, and the Hans Seidel Foundation from Munich. My name is Rüdiger Lenz, and I'm the director of the Aspen Institute in Berlin. A very warm welcome to you. And now I have the honor and the pleasure to welcome our two congressional representatives. In a time where, when confrontation between the two parties seems to trump the upcoming elections, we are very proud to sort of try a bipartisanship and a discussion between two seasoned politicians, one from the GOP and one from the Democrats, both discussing, discussing with us about the future and the current status of transatlantic relations. First, let me welcome Congressman Frank James Sensenbrenner, Jim. Very warm welcome to, to, to you. He is a Republican from Wisconsin, a state which is now very heatly, very heatly debated because of the current events in Kenosha. And maybe we come to that one later on. And second, we have Ami Berra joining us from California. A very warm welcome to you as well. I'm going in a minute to introduce the both of you and then introduce the topic, and then we will get our conversation going. Let me first come to you, Jim. You were first elected to the House of Representatives in 1978, a member of the House Committee on the Judiciary and Foreign Affairs. You have introduced the Patriot Act in the House in 2001. And you are also known as the author of the USA Freedom Act, introduced in 2013. You're not running for re-election in 2020, but Politico ranks your fifth congressional district in Wisconsin at least a solid GOP. So that we know. Now to Ami Berra. He was in Los Angeles in 1965. He is a first-generation American. His parents are both from India. He first won a congressional seat in 2012, was re-elected in 14, 16, and 18. He's a medical doctor, the longest serving Indian American in Congress, and a member of the House Foreign Affairs Committee. And as I've read in the, in the media files, Ami, allow me to say, you're a strong supporter of Kamala Harris and the ticket of Biden-Harris. Is that true? Looks that like it. So let me both uh, thank you for joining us today to this transatlantic town hall meeting from which we hope to get some insights and explanation of what your take is on the state and the future of transatlantic relations where we still have mutual interests and where we still differ. And last but not least, how it is possible to find a common ground in the future of both our relations. We are both challenged, Europe, Germany, and you, with climate change, with China, with Russia, and fighting pandemics. We are less than nine weeks away from the presidential election on November 3rd, and everybody here, at least on this continent, and especially in my country, thinks that the next president of the United States will be very decisive for our future perception of America and how we can still shape our future together. But gentlemen and dear listeners, let me just outline some, uh, some let's say, um, some household um, things, how to proceed with our session. First of all, you can raise your hand virtually and we will keep your questions and forward them to our two participants. Secondly, you also have a Q&A where you can write in, 
but please identify yourself and then we will call you up and hopefully we will continue with your questions, which will be answered by our two guests. But now about the crown rules. We'll, with those short introductory remarks, I will now come, come to our first introductory remarks of Jim. Jim, you have the floor, five minutes, and please tell us what your take is on the current and future transatlantic relations. Thank you. Well, thank you very much, Rudiger, for setting this thing up. Uh, let me say that uh, uh, when things are bipartisan, they're not newsworthy. Um, I get along very well with Ami, and I hope vice versa. Uh, however, unless we have a good fight, you're not going to read about it either in the domestic press or the international press. I think that's kind of unfortunate because we do more on a bipartisan basis uh, than we do when we're shaking fists at each other. Now, getting to the topic at hand. Now, this election is going to be determined almost exclusively on domestic issues. Uh, foreign policy is uh, not a subject of debate. Uh, I believe that uh, Trump will be defending his record on COVID and on law and order, which I think are the two hot button issues. Uh, Biden and Harris will attempt to denigrate it and hopefully explain to us uh, how they can do it better. Now, uh, after the election is over with, you know, assuming that things calm down, and I'm not so sure that's going to happen, uh, we start looking at what's going to happen in the next four years. Uh, let me say there is a lot of commonality if you look at the past records of both Trump and Biden. Uh, both of them have supported administration efforts uh, to increase the contribution to NATO by European countries, especially Germany. Uh, despite Trump saying that the TTIP proposal was a bad one, I think he would like to get some kind of a free trade agreement uh, with the EU. Although Trump really does not like multilateral institutions like the EU and would prefer to do it on a bilateral basis, but that's not the way the EU uh, framework is set up. Uh, but I can see an opening for some kind of, you know, a trade agreement, which will look a lot like the TTIP proposal, uh, but not exactly. Uh, I think the third thing that, uh, we need to do is to attempt to settle the privacy exchange issues. Uh, we've had uh, various types of privacy protections uh, that the European Court of Justice has struck down uh, because there are some plaintiffs that have claimed that they don't go far enough. Uh, if the privacy protections end up being shut down completely, the biggest hit will be transatlantic commerce and the economies on both sides of the Atlantic Ocean. So somehow we have to work out something uh, that uh, 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 the European Court of Justice will not strike down. Otherwise, there are gonna be a lot of people hurting. So thank you, Rudiger, and I'm happy to yield to Ami and looking forward to some questions. Thank you very much, Jim. And I think it was very encouraging, not only hearing from you all the keywords, the 2%, NATO alliance and also sort of TTIP light, which you gave us an idea of what could be achieved in the future. But there are also differences. Let me now switch to Ami. Ami, that sounds like there are no differences in foreign policy between the two parties, aren't there? You know, there, there certainly are different perspectives, I think, um, amongst the party. But you know, first, Rudiger, thank you for, for the invitation to, to participate here. Um, and also, just I'd like to recognize. Um, Jim's years of service to, to the United States and, and Congress, you know, it's certainly going to be missed, um, you know, just his experience. Um, on the Foreign Affairs Committee, both of us uh, have served um, on, on it. And the truth is, it's probably the most um, nonpartisan committee uh, in Congress, where when it comes to foreign policy, I think most of the members of Congress, you know, agree on most of the major issues. And if I think about the context of the transatlantic relationship in the, the last 75 years post-World War II, I think it served both our countries extremely well. You know, the, 
you know, the alliances that came about, you know, NATO through both in the, the post-war era, but also through the Cold War. And I think that strong partnership, that was not uh, from our end, a democratic um, relationship or Republican relationship um, really did, you know, um, serve not just Europe and the United States well, but also the, the rest of the world. I do think in the midst of this pandemic, which is um, not hitting one country, it's hitting the entire world at the same time, there's an opportunity to rethink what this relationship looks like going forward. Um, you know, the, the election on November 3rd certainly um, will hold some relevance in, in terms of how we proceed. You know, I think Jim touched on TTIP. You know, I certainly was, a, a had you asked me four or five years ago, I would have thought we would have um, finished and ratified the Trans-Pacific Partnership. We would have been making progress on TTIP and we would have been um, you know, creating a global framework for the movement of goods and services. You know, I think one difference, um, you know, Jim touched on President Trump's um, you know, fondness of more bilateral type of agreements. I think if there's a, a future President Biden, you know, certainly his history has suggested you know, a, a, a willingness to look at a more multilateral framework. That said, I do, you know, I, I hope Jim's correct that regardless who, who enters office, that we are working to, to, to push forward a trade deal with the European Union and, and some parameters. I also think um, as we look at this pandemic, as we look at um, global vaccine development, distribution, and, and how we get to vaccinate six to seven billion people around the world, there's a unique opportunity for partnership um, as well moving forward. Uh, you know, and I think you know, again, if there's a, a President Biden, you know, I think you will see more of a multilateral approach. You know, President Trump certainly has has taken um, a more bilateral approach and 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 looking at negotiating some of those deals. And then the last thing that you know, I, I would probably share if I think about my vision going forward, I do think one of the um, strategic um, I don't want to say failure, but you know, from our foreign policy perspective. We had a very robust transatlantic um, strategy. We certainly have um, what we're now calling an Indo-Pacific strategy. But in the context of the 21st century, can we bring those two strategies together? And you know, where like-minded countries, like-minded allies with similar values of democracy, of free market opportunities, uh, of the movement of goods and services can create a framework where um, we're working to, to, together to create that context in the 21st century. And, you know, I, I'm sure in the question and answer session, we'll t have some conversation about kind of the rise of China and, you know, what that looks like vis-a-vis -vis Germany, as well as the United States. And what are those opportunities for us to, to work together? So I'll, I'll keep my comments short and turn it back over to you, Rudy. And, you know, let's have Thank a conversation. <laughs> Thank you, Ami. Thank you so much. But if we listen to both of you, it seems like everything is in order. It's only sort of a, a, a difference maybe here and there in style. But I think as we sort of perceive it at the moment, there are some substantial rifts, maybe not with Congress, but more with the White House. And here I would sort of name, you just mentioned multilateralism. Uh, and I think Jim rightly so mentioned that the president would sort of prefer to have bilateral agreements with certain partners within the EU but the EU as an institution exists. So either you exist that their multilateralism is an important pillar of international relations or don't. So let me put the question forward in a different way to both of you. I think we are very grateful for the last 75 years where we had sort of a sound basis of trust partnership. And now we have the feeling that is more about competitors seen as competitors, sometimes even seen as adversaries, adversaries. And I think we have to rebuild trust and partnership. So what can we do, Jim, if there is a problem? How we can, can we address that problem, Jim? Well, a lot, a lot of it depends upon personalities. Yes. Uh, uh, you know, Obama got along much better with Chancellor Merkel than Trump has gotten along. You know, that's uh, that's a fact. You know, nobody can really argue that point. Uh, but 
to try to get beyond personalities, I think we have to look at issues. Now, first of all, you've got the 2% issue. You know, the issue is not Germany throwing more euros in a pot that can be divided up. It's Germany spending more money on Germany's defense. And the other countries that are short of the 2% it would be spending money on their own defense. You know, the problem that I have is that with Brexit now being a stated fact, uh, 83% of the cost of defending Europe is borne by non-EU countries, US, Canada, UK, Norway, and Turkey. And that's not fair, but uh, uh, that has got to be recognized and that has got to be addressed. Now, on the trade issue, you know, there's, there is a lot of pressure on both parties from their business constituencies to get to some kind of an agreement uh, whether it's with the EU, which is the way the EU framework works now, uh, with the UK separately. Uh, frankly, I don't really care, uh, but I do think that uh, it's important that we consider trade with Europe, which includes the UK, you know, basically in one basket, where you see a great difference between Trump and Biden is on China. And uh, uh, I think that uh, the world is going to have to face up to what the Chinese are up to, both economically and militarily. Uh, and uh, all you need to do is look at the wholesale pirating of everybody's intellectual property. Europe's, ours, Japan's, everybody's on that. And I think the key to curtailing uh, Chinese economic and military penetration is to have the Chinese fall by the same rules on intellectual property rights protection that the rest of the world does. Thank you very much, Jim. I think you made it loud and clear that China is one of the things which we have to deal with. And Amy, you are uh, the chairman of the subcommittee on Asia. Question goes to you. Uh, could we expect if there is a Biden administration that uh, it will be less pressing us to sort of join the anti-China crusade as Trump wants us to join? Is there a difference in positioning? You know, I, I think that um, a potential Biden administration will take a, a much um, harder line on, on, on China and understanding where China is today compared to where it may have been 10 years ago. Um, and what we're seeing happening within China, you know, whether that's with the Uyghur population, um, what we're seeing in Hong Kong, and you know, potentially, you know, concerns about what's happening um, around Taiwan as well. And I, I do think this is where, you know, you know, when President Trump wants Germany to join more of a multilateral coalition, you know, if we try to address the China challenge um, in a bilateral way, I think we will have a, you know, a much harder um, time getting China to, to make some necessary reforms. You know, Jim touched on a, a number of them um, that, that really have to, have to occur. I think we will be much stronger if we can create a multilateral coalition that's based on a rules-based order you know, based on you know, you know whether it's intellectual property protections. You know, we're spending a lot of time on the committee looking at what's happening in the South China Sea and the issue of freedom of navigation and you know um, maritime security issues that are there. You know, it's my I don't think any of us would like to see a, a a a direct kinetic confrontation with China, but can we move China in a direction where they understand there has to be a rules based order? And yeah, you know, I think. You know, President Trump's style is much more direct and in your face. I think Vice President Biden's style would be, you know, a, a, a little bit less direct. But I think at the end of the day, the questions that either a Trump administration or a Biden administration would be asking are going to be similar, um, similar questions and with similar opportunities. And I think, you know, from my vantage as chair of the Asian Pacific Subcommittee, we'll have a much better chance to 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 move China in the right direction if we approach this as allies in a multilateral way with um, mutual goals. I mean, if I understand you right, you're you're seeking and looking for European support in this direction. 
And as a parliamentarian and congressman, you might already have had contacts to the EU, maybe even the Germans. So what was the response when you told them or invited them to join that coalition and take a tougher stand? That would be interesting for our audience. You know, I, I think at the um, member of Congress Bundestag level, that conversation is, I think we're on the same page here. I think we both recognize that German companies and US companies um, recognize the, the practice patterns of, of the, the Chinese. And, you know, it's in our mutual interest to, to, to create more of a rules-based um, order here. And that's different than it was even, you know, three, four, five years ago, where, you know, I think coming out of the, the last recession in 2009, 2010, you know, everyone was rushing to China to, to, to invest and, in, in, you know, break into the Chinese markets that helped many of our companies get through that recession. But we also gave up a lot in terms of um, business protections, um, intellectual property protections, et cetera. Um, and we knew what the Chinese were doing. I think coming into this decade um, and where China is today, the companies are looking at this a, a little bit differently now. And I think you know, there is a real opportunity for um, for the, the Bundestag and Congress, along with you know other like-minded allies to work together here. In Thank you very much. And now I think we would like to include our audience. And I think already I have two very interesting questions from a very seasoned diplomat, former Ambassador John Kornblum. The Trump first question goes to Jim Sensenbrenner. He says and asks, Trump pushes a zero-sum game of international relations. Do you believe the US and Europe maintain a workable partnership in this on this basis? Jim, the question is to you. Well, I would disagree with the bastard Kornblum is saying. You know, it's not a, it is not a zero sum uh, relationship. You know, there are concerns. You know, there's the two percent issue uh, that has been hanging out there, uh, and it's Germany probably is one of the is the lowest of the major countries, but others have caused the problem. That's not a zero sum game. You know, that's the fact that Europe has to stand up for more of its defense. Uh, uh, given the fact that 83% of the cost of NATO is borne by non-EU members. As far as trade goes and China, you know, intellectual property protection is really the key, you know, and I remember uh, that when I had an interplay with Chancellor Merkel over 10 years ago that said we have to protect intellectual property to protect German exports. This is the chancellor uh, saying that, and she's absolutely right on that, but nobody seems to have been able to do anything effectively. Now, we all hope that when China was brought into the WTO in 2001, they would behave themselves and follow the rules that everybody else was. They just figured out a different way to cheat. And, uh, uh, you know, things have gone on and they've gotten worse and worse. So the initial impact is that they are able to use inventions that we have made, U.S. and Europe, uh, to be able to use their slave labor factories to undersell products that we make, both for domestic consumption as well as the exports. We have a common interest in that. And we need to stand up for that. That is not a zero-sum game. You know, the other thing is, is you know, we have to look forward. Uh, once we get beyond the COVID-19 problem, you know, number one, we need to look for, more, more forward in a medical uh, standpoint, because this is not the last pandemic that we're going to have to face. Hopefully, the next one will be more than 100 years away, but it's coming, and we all know that. So we're going to have to figure out how to squash it at its source so that it doesn't get out and infect the whole world and kill and make ill an awful lot of people. There is a commonality there, too. And, uh, you know, uh, whoever ends up developing, you know, the, the first effective vaccine with no side effects, they're going to have a patent. And darn it, the money that they put at risk uh, ought to be protected by making sure that the factories in China and India, you know, don't steal the patent and undersell them because there was a lot of money that's been used to develop a vaccine and we're not going to have any more vaccines develop if that's what happens. 
Jim, thank you very much for reminding us what, what future challenges lie ahead. But let me just have a short sidestep because we have a medical doctor amongst us. Ami Berra was also a professor at the University of California. And you just, Jim, mentioned COVID-19 and pandemics. Uh, Ami, many people of us here ask themselves, how come that a so developed country like the United States with high level of medicine, technology, and, and science did react so lately and should be so wrong on the pandemic COVID-19. Give me your assessment, please. You know, I, th I think the, um, the, the biggest mistake that, that, that was made, and I think a lot of people underestimated um, how severe the, 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 the novel coronavirus, now known as COVID-19, was, was going to be and the impact that, that it was going to have. So, yeah, I, I think a, a couple of things here. One, you know, I'd be critical of the Trump administration for not taking a, a, a federal um, a, approach. So for the federal government to not allow 50 states to do their own thing, but rather say, okay, here's what we have to do as the United States of America based on the science and, and the evidence. If President Trump were to ask me, I would say, you know, let the doctors and the scientists, you know, be the face of, of the pandemic. One, I think it would be better for them politically, but two, I think, you know, if we were just to, to base this on science and, um, you know, and, and you know, you know, what, what the data suggests that we should do. I think that was a, a challenge, which meant 50 states were doing their own thing. So at times you saw some states opening up sooner, some states, you know, shutting down sooner. I think we're getting to a better place where, you know, I, I think there's a realization across the country and across the, the governors that this virus isn't going away and that we're in this and we should take this uh, uh, as the, the long haul. Short question, short answer. I'm short answer, short question. One question from Pepper de Callier from Prague. Should the successful vaccine be allocated globally and shared beyond the country of discovery? I, I, I absolutely think it should be that. You know, everyone should work together on this. Whoever, because we have to vaccinate six to seven billion people around the world if we want to defeat this pandemic. So, you know, the, the manufacturers should all work together and the countries should all work together. One question for both of you, and it comes from Harrison Wetworth, who is a young Atlantic Brooker alumnus, and he asked, there seems to be a bipartisan agreement that the US and the EU must onshore critical manufacturing capacity. That was one of the lessons we all took from COVID-19. What are the prospects for US and German collaborating on boosting manufacturing to counter China? Jim, you're first. Well, you know, my feeling is is that uh, the best way to boost manufacturing, you know, is to have a trade agreement that reduces or eliminates tariffs, not only on manufactured products, but uh, the parts that are used to build those manufactured products, because that is increasingly internationalized now. You know, you get on a plane, uh, you know, it might be made in. Toulouse, it might be made in Seattle, uh, but the content of that plane is extremely international. So we can't be having tariffs, you know, on parts that are shipped to make the final product. Uh, you know, the other thing uh, we need to do, I think, is not only to deal with intellectual property rights enforcement, but also to figure out a way where we can uh, kind of uh, integrate our antitrust uh, considerations. The problem we have there is that European antitrust law is designed to protect the competition. American antitrust law is designed to protect the consumer. So you can have an antitrust question that resolved in favor of the company in Europe, but rejected in the United States and vice versa. And we've got to be able to make sure that we have an integrated system, so if it's approved on one side of the Atlantic, it would be approved on the other side of the Atlantic, rather than having lawsuit after lawsuit. Thank you very much. I mean, shortly, same question, same, uh, not your answer, please. Yeah, of course. So I, I think the pandemic really did expose the, uh, a supply chain that is dependent on a single source, in this case, China. So I think in certain places, onshoring um, and bringing manufacturing back to Europe and, um, and the United States will, will be necessary.
But I also think the, the conversation of building redundancy. So can we, you know, for some of these low margin products, the, the raw ingredients that are mostly coming out of China, can we look at other places like Vietnam, India, and, and work together as an EU um, to, to create some of those? Because I don't know that the raw ingredients are going to come back to either Europe or, or the United States because of, of the low margins. But we do have to have redundancy in different um, sources. Let's stick at trade for a moment. I think there's another um, ambassador, former ambassador joining us, uh, and he asked, uh, it is J.D. Vandenagel, and he asked, what do we have expect, what do we expect from maybe future trade uh, talks, TTIP or a renewal of TPP, uh, whereas instead we are hearing until today that more tariffs will be put on Europe instead of renegotiating new trade agreement. So, Jim, what is the direction of maybe another Trump administration? More trade talks or more trade tariffs and additional sanctions? Jim? That's all. Wait till after the election. Okay. So, uh, <laughs> thank you very much. And what to expect from Biden? You know, I think um, from Biden, you know, certainly he was a supporter of, of TPP. And you know, so I think you will see a, a more robust discussion and negotiation. I think both Jim and I feel like, you know, getting to a place where you're not, you know, overly, you don't have an overly burdened tariff system, but you have a fair rules-based order competition. It's not a bad thing. It actually brings the best out, out in folks. and. Yeah, I, I do hope that whether it's a Trump administration or a Biden administration that we restart these conversations. Uh, a question to both of you. I think poli policy is as well about about actions as much as it is about style and tone. Here comes a question from the incoming president of the American Academy, Daniel Benjamin. And he asks, President Trump has shown a remarkable tolerance for regimes that treat their critics and opponents with the harshest treatment. How do we explain President Trump's posture toward Russia and Saudi Arabia, and how would President Biden differ? First, Jim, again, please, can you explain your president's, let's say, stance? Well, uh, let, you know, let me say that uh, uh, Putin's Russia and Xi's China uh, have not been friends of the West. They want to get uh, uh, superiority over the West uh, economically, you know, as well as in terms of geopolitical stuff. There will be a test coming up very soon relative to Belarus. Uh, and the Lukashenko, in my opinion, stealing uh, of the election. You know, if Europe does not take the lead and stand up to this cancer that is uh, east of the European Union, you know, and prevent Putin from sending in Russian police if Lukashenko doesn't have enough to suppress the opposition. That will be an indication of reliance upon Europe, either by a Trump or by a Biden administration. Uh, you know, again, a lot of what we deal with in the Foreign Affairs Committee is bipartisan. You know, Ami is absolutely correct on this. Uh, but you know, there comes some time, uh, you know, when uh, a European problems should be dealt with primarily by Europe, and Belarus is one of them. I mean, what about Biden? Yeah, so a, a Biden, I think the Biden administration would um, take a, a, a more traditional a, approach. Um, you know, if you just look at his 36 years in, in the Senate, Many of those as chair of the, the Senate Foreign Relations Committee. But I, I would act, you know, touching on um, some of what Jim said with regards to Trump's approach to foreign policy, it's not necessarily just a Republican or Democratic <laughs> issue because I, you know, if somehow Bernie Sanders became president of the United States, I think Bernie Sanders' foreign policy approach might be much more similar to, to, to where President Trump is. And I think. That does touch on, you know, in the 21st century, but there, the reality in the United States is we do have domestic issues that we have to focus on, issues of, you know, um, a lot of jobs, manufacturing sector, et cetera, a lot of people that, that are, 
you know, very, very concerned. And those were many of the folks that were drawn to Donald Trump's message in 2016 of America first rebuilding things. And I think you see that in, in the 2% and, and, you know, yeah. the, the, the fatigue of general foreign policy. I don't think that's the right approach, but I do think creating more modern 21st century coalitions um, that then can help us address 21st century challenges is the approach that the Biden administration would take. Uh, Jim, you said before in one of your statements that uh, politics is also about personal relationship. Sometimes they're working better, sometimes they're working not so well. Here comes a question which is, I think could spice up our discussion a little bit. Also from John Kornblum to you, Jim. Why does Trump hate Germany? Why does he hate Merkel? Is it because of Trump's goal of weakening the EU and NATO? which sort of seems to be in his own interest as well. Can you give us a personal statement on that one? If you want me to give a partisan or a nonpartisan statement in response to Mr. Trump. A partisan statement, please. Well, uh, you know, Trump has a different personality than any of his predecessors as president. You know, we all can agree with that. People who complain about Trump's personality, my response was, look, the voters wanted something different four years ago. They knew what his personality was like, and they elected him uh, on this. Now, you know, in terms of, you know, Trump's personality, you know, with Chancellor Merkel, I've known her since 1995. You know, she is a very patient woman. I think that was one of the keys to her success in German electoral politics, you know, having said all of that, you know, the adjustment from Obama and Bush uh, to Trump, you know, has uh, been you know, kind of a rocky road because he is so different. You know, I believe that politics sometimes is a matter of necessity. I think that there will be less in terms of personal friendship uh, and more in terms of substantive discussions, uh, you know, for the remainder of uh, Merkel's term should Trump be reelected. And if Biden is elected, uh, uh, Biden knows the chancellor, you know, and players in German politics as well. Uh, there might be a better vibes between uh, Biden and Merkel. Uh, but, you know, the quicker we get the substance, the sooner we're able to get to some real accomplishments. Thank you very much. Next question goes to uh, Ami. Ami, uh, there is Benjamin Hintz who asked, Vice President Biden has been taking a very tough stance on Russia. How would the Biden administration approach Russia and especially projects like Nord Stream 2, which is highly debated at the moment? And I would like to get your assessment on that one, please. Yeah, so I, th I think the Biden administration will take a, a very tough um, line with uh, with Putin, and you know, certainly I think working with the the EU, what we're seeing in Belarus, I think the Biden administration would lean in there, and then also you know many unresolved <laughs> issues in, in Ukraine um, as well. So I I think they would take a, a, a tough line. Um, I might I might defer the Nord Stream two to, to to Jim on judiciary, but you know obviously there there is some concern with Russia having um, leverage if, if so much of the energy supply is coming out of, of Russia. You know that's something that we certainly should debate. You know, and and the issue of secondary sanctions, I know you know was, was on a call with members of the Bundestag a while ago. Is something that's of real concern in Germany as well. But one question to you, I mean, you're still in Congress. Is it coming secondary sanctions? Because everybody here is not only wondering, but also frightened that you are sort of uh, threatening one of your close allies with secondary sanctions. I mean, I, my, my personal viewpoint is on, we should use secondary sanctions, not on our friends. We should use it on our, our adversaries. Thank you very much. Uh, Heinz Eberhard Manke was is for a long time waiting now to uh, get his question to the two panelists. Uh, could you please unmute your mic and ask your question? Heinz Eberhard Manke, please. Yes, thank you very much. Uh, I put it down uh, as a text version as well. My point is you both 
from both parties began by mentioning the 2% of Germany missing what is agreed to as a NATO uh, contribution. In the budget for Germany for 2019, 43 billion of dollars were declared for defense expenses. And uh, okay, and comparable uh, to that, 22 billion were declared for money spent for refugee programs. And we all know that a good fraction of all the refugees coming to uh, Europe, not only to Europe, but <clears throat> others as well, uh, are the result of actions which in a way have to do with military uh, things which were going on. So <clears throat> I would like to know uh, whether there would be a difference in the opinion between the two possibilities as the uh, president, <clears throat> whether part of that would be considered as kind of a compensation for the missing part, for the missing fraction in the budget for the for the NATO. Let me frame it, uh, Mr. Manke, if you allow me, let me frame it the following way. Mr. Manke wants to put the eight to 10 billions, which we spent for the refugee on top of our defense budget, and then we are meeting close the 2%. Would that be acceptable to both of you? I mean, first. Um, you know, pro probably not because you know, I would separate those two. Certainly, we applaud the humanitarian efforts that um, you know, Germany has, has done to, to step up and, and help with the refugee crisis. But I, I think I would probably look at those slightly separately. I, have, I would answer that question, no. Uh, the fact is, is that after the Vietnam War, we accepted a lot of refugees. And until this migration occurred starting about four years ago, uh, the United States probably accepted 60% or more of the total refugee flood of the, uh, uh, in the world. That has now changed. The fact is, is that the 2% uh, was calling on those countries that were below the 2% to spend the additional money on their own military. So, as I said earlier, this would be in uh, bringing more up to date uh, Germany's equipment, uh, maybe improving infrastructure in the former GDR, uh, so that in case uh, troops and heavy equipment had to be moved east, uh, the infrastructure would be able uh, to handle them. You know, the two percent is not a military foreign aid program for any of the NATO member states. It's spending more money on your own defense, and that was what was agreed to by uh, all of the uh, uh, chiefs of state, chiefs of government, at a NATO meeting, I believe, in Wales in 2014. But there has been very, very slow uh, adherence to it. You know, except uh, by the U.S. and uh, those countries in Eastern Europe that border on Russia. Thank you for that clarification. Let us come to another tricky issue, which is highly debated between our two countries, which is climate change. Uh, your president stepped out of the Paris Accord, and since then, I think we sort of a stalemate and maybe even a, a uh, gone back in, in uh, trying to fight uh, global climate change. So the question from David is, how can the US and the EU better cooperate on fighting the climate crisis? Jim, you are first. Well, as you know, I've been an opponent of both the Kyoto Treaty and the Paris Accord because it's not going to solve the problem. Where the mistake that was made originally, and this was back in the early to mid 90s, you know, is to think by taxing or making more expensive uh, fossil fuels. We would raise the price of fossil fuels. People would use less of them, and there would be greenhouse gas emissions reductions. Uh, that hasn't worked. Uh, and wherever there have been proposals to raise taxes or fees or cap and trade or whatever it is, the political backlash has made it impossible. Now, unfortunately, after Kyoto failed, 
uh, in 2009. That same matrix was used uh, to put together uh, the Paris Accords, although it was made voluntary. Uh, I would doubt that many of the countries will end up uh, uh, achieving the voluntary emissions that uh, their leaders ended up uh, promising in Paris. We won't know that for a couple of years now, you know, until the numbers are added up. But what I can say is that Trump ran against Paris, Bush ran against Kyoto, both of them won. Uh, when Macron tried to put a modest tax you know, on French fuel, you know, we had, you know, the riots in Paris streets. And, you know, what you need to do on this issue is what is politically achievable. And the promises of Paris and the promises of Kyoto are not political achievable. Uh, I hope that my friends on the other side run strongly in favor of Paris because that will help Trump out. Uh, Ami, I think we heard from Biden already that day one he will sort of really not not re-enter the Paris Accord. So there seems at least to be a big difference between the two parties and the two candidates. Ami. Yeah, yeah, absolutely. I think a Biden administration would um, would get back into the Paris Accord. But also, I, I don't disagree with Jim that you know the Paris Accord in and of itself doesn't solve climate change, but it is very symbolic that you know as a world we're committed to. I, I think you will see the most ambitious um, plan of any any U.S. president should President Biden get um, elected. But I think it will focus on job creation. I think it will focus on you know, using our competitive edge in manufacturing and renewable energy space in more um, efficient batteries and, and and you know electric vehicles, et cetera. Because I do think you know whether that comes five years from now, ten years from now. Through the competitive marketplace, you know you're going to see more of a transition in that direction because it'll be cost savings, and, and these are growing markets, and and I think that will be a big emphasis of the Biden plan. Uh, thank you, Ami. I think we have tackled a lot of specific questions where we either are still on the same track or we are differing. Differing, but here comes a very interesting uh, question, which hits, so to speak, the focus of our past relationship values, trust, and what have you. The question comes from Heiner Spalnik, and he asks, uh, he asks, I'm realizing that the people of Europe, Germany, and America are losing more and more a common understanding of each other. America for, uh, for us elder has had, for example, or has been, for, for example, a role model. And that, and I can underline that, has changed. Our mutual perceptions have changed. And how come and what can we do against it? I mean, would you like to address it directly? Sure. I, I, I think uh, America, the United States post World War II, you know, as, as the, the major economy that was still standing really had to step up. You know, the Marshall Plan, you know, is probably the most remarkable aid and development plan in, in our history, you know, and what it achieved in, in Europe and with Germany, um, you know, rebuilding Japan. You know, stepping up in in on the Korean Peninsula and seeing where South Korea is today, I think that that U.S.-led global order was incredibly um, important during the Cold War and the the, the past seventy five years. But I do think going forward, you know, Germany is a, a, a leading economy in the world, a, a leading democracy. In the world. Japan is a leading democracy. Um, Korea is a leading democracy in economy. How do we, instead of, you know, I, I do think there's a domestic pressure where the American public is saying, well, we're shouldering so much of the burden around the world. Instead, how do we all work together to do aid and development, you know, better, to advance democracies around the world? And, you know, I, I think our values are so very similar, our values of free market competition, of, of human rights, of, you know, principles of democracy and, and individual freedoms. I think those are still foundational values that we share, but I do think there's a domestic pressure here in the United States of saying, how can we share this burden you know, with, with our, our like-minded allies that are truly developed economies? Thank you, uh, Ami. And, and Jim, I think you have been a very long serving member of Congress and you know about transatlantic relationship and our partnership, especially between Germany and the United States, which was always based on values 
and sort of uh, the same view about issues like con being confronted with Russia or threats from the outside. So is the value base still intact in your, from your point of view? Well, that, you know, values based is, you know, what Ami is saying, but I would add a little bit more. You know, the way you earn respect is by working with people. You know, you don't necessarily respect or trust someone you have just met. You know, you have to work with them. You have to get to know them. You have to see how they respond to common problems. If you differ with them, how you negotiate out an agreement. Uh, and to be honest with you, you know, the sooner we can get back to international travel and have face-to-face -face meetings and not have to rely on Zoom or WebEx or, or you know, whatever, whatever else we're doing, I think the better off well, we would be. You know, it would be much better to have this discussion today in Berlin where Ami and you and I were sitting, you know, in front of a group, you know, where they could look at our body language, our intonations, and things like that. Uh, this is better than doing nothing at all. Uh, but, you know, you, you get respect on an interpersonal uh, basis. And, you know, this is very sanitized of necessity. Thank you very much on touching a point which we all experienced in the last couple of weeks and month, and hopefully we will go come uh, over it in, in due time, because as you say, uh, personal contacts are uh, absolutely important, maybe more, much more important and much more valuable than what we are doing. But what we do today is at least something which we couldn't have done in the past as easily, because uh, the virtual link is much easier to establish and bringing you over from the United States to Berlin, but we'll invite you and maybe in the future we'll have some personal meetings again. And Ami, as I said before, has already been here. Uh, Bettina Lusha, uh, you haven't posed a question by writing, but if you would like to unmute your mic, you can pose your question now. Bettina Lusha, do you hear me? Bettina, are you still with us? Yes, hello, it's Bettina Lucia. Thank you so much. I love these kind of events. I love these kind of discussions. Um, I am concerned about where we are heading next. Um, to less than two months from now, there's an election. And very, very strongly, there are fears in the United States and I think in many places around the world where we are heading with the democratic uh, rituals and, and the election outcomes. How can you, who are models for bipartisanship, allay those fears about where US democracy is going? There are many concerns around the world and, and a lot in the US about the outcome of the elections, about the fairness of the elections, about whether the people will be able to vote and what the consequences will be. So I would love to hear your ideas. Who will be first, Jim? Uh, the first election that was held uh, where there were uh, worries about COVID-19, mail-in ballots and things like that was our presidential primary in Wisconsin in April. And uh, that turned out fairly well. The turnout was large. Many people voted by mail. Uh, there was not a COVID spike uh, for those who did vote in person or those who uh, were administering the elections in the polling places and counting up the ballots. Uh, uh, I would hope that, you know, there would be, you know, a repeat on that. Now, you know, what we have to emphasize is not whether the post will deliver the ballots on time, but personal responsibility. If you mail your ballot the day before the election, it's not going to get there on time, regardless of the problems we have in the Postal Service. So apply for your ballot early, get it early, mail it back early, you know, no problem uh, on that. You know, the, the, you know, the other thing is, is that most states allow early voting. If you don't want to stand in line, you can go to your city hall or rot house, you know, get a ballot and vote, vote it, and it will be, uh, it will be counted. So, you know, it's only when the election is very, very close 
that you have problems. And remember, uh, because our presidential election is really 50 separate elections in each state that are held at the same time, you know, the problems can be minimized to the states where uh, the election is very close and the electors that are sent to the electoral college are hanging the balance. Sonia, tell us, do you hear me? If you can unmute your mic, you can also pose your question. Sonia? Hello? Can you hear me? Hello. Uh, Sorry. Can you hear me now? Yes, absolutely. Please. I apologize. I have my little son in the background. He might be crying in a second. Uh, so that's why I posted the written question. So my question was um, on transatlantic cooperation um, with regard to climate issues sort of beyond um, the Paris Agreement and beyond any sort of um, multilateral deals. Um, where do you see, is, is there a future for that? I mean, because I guess both uh, Germany and the EU and the US need to deal with, with climate change somehow, even if the existing structures are ineffective. So I'm just was just wondering on your perspective on that. Um, you know, we, I'll, I'll go ahead and take that. Um, I, I think very, very much so there's, there's an opportunity, but I think economics will drive some of this. You see um, German automakers very much making um, big investments in electric vehicles and, and the, the technology that, that goes there. And I would, I would encourage our U.S. automakers to be doing the same thing. Um, and, and I think the economics will, will drive this. And you know, certainly the number of jobs that, that can come out of the investments in renewable energy and, and cleaner energy sources. Um, I also think that the fossil fuel companies, the oil companies recognize this as, as well. And, and, you know, can we come up with policies that accelerate these investments and, and move us into um, more carbon friendly um, energy sources. Thank you. Here comes a question from Michelle Auga, and I think she rightly so mentions that uh, we, what we what we just witness at the moment is a confrontational sort of split uh, amongst the society in the United States, maybe fueled by the upcoming election. And she asked, the present traje trajectory of the U.S. society carries huge risks. Millennials may soon be without much memory of a tolerant public discourse. How do you assess the responsibility of the elites? Isn't there a need to reintegrate opponents into institutions? Jim, uh, you have a long, long history of working within parliament, state parliament, and then Congress. Uh, is there is sort of a public discourse with has, which has lost the art of compromise? Well, yes, there is. Uh, and, you know, there you know, are a lot of people, you know, that think the apocalypse will come if the other side wins the election. Now, much of this is driven by negative ads that go on the television um, in the month or so before the election. And uh, the way the courts have interpreted well-intentioned changes in campaign finance laws end up having these unintended consequences ruling the day. Uh, I think that's unfortunate because most of the independent expenditures can never say anything positive about anybody. And, uh, you know, as a result, uh, the people who lose the election, you know, think that, uh, the devil was elected on the other side, and it makes no difference how Republicans view a Democratic winner or vice versa. Uh, you know, so a lot of this is media driven. You know, the media has a 24 hour news cycle. I think what's big news now is not big news two hours from now. And as a result, there are no lessons that are learned from history. I mean, what about the public discourse? You know, I, I, I do think the public discourse has, has gone sideways or back backwards. I certainly agree with Jim on the the, the power of negative um, advertising, but I also think it's how people consume media nowadays. You know, when you know, I was growing up, you had Walter Cronkite, or you had you know, so, and it was nonpartisan news. They were just delivering the news. Today, you know, if you go to Fox or if you go to MSNBC, it may just be news of reinforcing what you already believe in. You know, as opposed to just objectively, you know, creating critical thinking and, and allowing people to, to make decisions on their own. I think that has created, um, you know, 
some of the toxic nature of, of, of discourse. I'm an optimist, though. I actually, you know, you know our democracy has been tested in the past, and we've had you know, periods like this in the 1960s and, and elsewhere. And I do think you know we'll we'll come out of this hopefully in a, a more resilient, stronger place with our democracy and our discourse. Let's stick to the election and, and uh, put a question forward, which is sort of a little bit looking into the crystal ball. Here comes the question from Holger Frank. He asked, the election seems to be a very close race. What will be the decisive factor to win from your point of view, Ami? What will be the decisive chaos or law and order? Yeah, so, so I think this will be a close election. I think, you know, that there'll be two different candidates that are both well known. In 2016, I think voters wanted to see a change. They didn't really know how President Trump would govern. That's not the case today. They, he has three and a half years as, as president, and they've seen his leadership style as well as you know his governing style. And Joe Biden is obviously well known as well. And I think you know, there'll be a bit of a referendum on President Trump and his leadership, whether people liked it or didn't like it. But also, there's a clear alternative that people know fairly well in, in Vice President Biden. And, and you know, I, I think Vice President Biden will win. Um, but uh, obviously, I, I, I do think this will be a close race. And, uh, you know, everyone's taking it very seriously. Jim, your assessment. I mean, you're from Wisconsin. Wisconsin at the moment is a little bit in the focus of the international attention of what has happened in Kenosha. So give me your assessment from a sort of Wisconsin point of view. Well, you know, let me say it will be a very close election. And Wisconsin, even before the problems in Kenosha, was a battleground state. Uh, both sides have said the road to the White House goes through Wisconsin, which is going to be a very interesting time for me for the next nine weeks or so. Uh, uh, things are very fluid. Uh, three weeks ago, nobody would have expected there would have been uh, a problem in Kenosha. Uh, there was a problem in Kenosha. Uh, the governor did not send in enough National Guard troops. Uh, the president, uh, he had to go ask the president uh, to send in some after initially rejecting it. Uh, Trump is probably arriving in Kenosha uh, as we speak now, uh, to do uh, an assessment and to talk to the guard and to, uh, the police that, that were there. Uh, how this ends up uh, working out, nobody knows. You know, let me say that there are investigations that are going on as to what actually happened a week and a day ago, uh, as well as what happened with the young man who violated both Wisconsin and Illinois firearms regulations. <laughs> Uh, when uh, uh, the two demonstrators were shot uh, and he's claiming self-defense, that will end up coming out on trial. So there's a lot more water to go over the dam. The fact of the matter is, is that, you know, if there are people from outside that come to stir up trouble, uh, uh, they're going to have to be dealt with severely. And the Kenosha Police Department did not arrest a lot of people, but uh, they did say that the people who were arrested less than 44 different cities as their homes or which were on their IDs. Uh, and that is concerning that a lot of people from outside went to Kenosha. And Jim. listen, listen uh, uh, I'm going to have to go because I've got a flight uh, uh, back to D.C. in a couple of hours and we're a little bit over uh, the, the, the time. So thank you for having me. And. I think there's been a very good discussion. Thank you, Jim, and uh, thank you, uh, Ami. Thanks to both of you, but also thank our audience, which not only has been very patient, but put forward a lot of very interesting questions. And let me let me say one final word from my point of view. Uh, you really showed that there is a civil and, and, uh, and constructive debate possible. So thank you for the style and thank you for the content of our discussion today. And Jim, after a long life in Congress, we wish you a nice ride into sunset. And Ami... I'm not riding that way. I'm going to be around. <laughs> Maybe on your... You have a light, nice country estate where you where you spend the next, con, next, next couple of, of years and you have President Reagan standing behind you. 
Yeah. He, was, he was having a lot of years when he left politics, so we wish you a lot of years to come. But Ami, let me say, we hope that the election turns out as you and we wish, and from a point of view where all the reasonable people stick together. So thank you for your voice of reason, both, and thank you for a very good discussion. We hope to have you again on, on the 23rd of September. We hope that all of the audience will join us again when we'll have the former ambassador of the US to, to, uh, to Berlin and the German ambassador to the United States, Mrs. Haber, on the topic of mutual perception, how we see each other. And as Jim, you said, it's based on trust and it's personal relationship which counts. And today, even with virtual relationship, you had a good relationship. Thank you to both of you. Good night and good luck and good day in America. Thank you.